This week's worship video, I'm in the office of our MPP for Ottawa Centre, Joel Harden. And uh, Joel, it's great to have you with us. It's an absolute pleasure. And uh, Joel is going to lead off by reading the scripture for this coming Sunday. Thank you. Um, a reading from the Gospel of Luke. In the 15th year of the reign of Emperor Tiberius, when Pontius Pilate was governor of Judea, and Herod was ruler of Galilee, his brother Philip, ruler of the region of Ituria, and Traconitis, and Lithensis, ruler of Abilene. During the high priesthood of Annas and Caiaphas, the word of God came to John, son of Zechariah, in the wilderness. 
he went into all the region around the Jordan, proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. As it is written in the book of the words of the prophet Isaiah, quote, the voice of one crying out in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. Every valley shall be filled and every mountain and hill shall be made low and the crooked shall be made straight and the rough ways made smooth and all flesh shall see the salvation of God, the gospel of Christ. So Joel, we are going to circle back to that reading, but first we're going to set our own context in dialogue with mm -hmm. the reading. Mm -hmm. uh, so I'm going to ask you about uh, your role as uh, our MPP. Sure. Uh, how long have you been in this role? I was very fortunate to get elected uh, with a great team uh, on June 7th, 2018. So I've been doing this role for about three and a half years. And uh, what are your duties? Mm. So the most important duty, I think, Gary, is to listen uh, to what the community wants. Uh, so we take a lot of care. Before the pandemic, we held monthly town halls, several roundtables, uh, just trying to figure out what was really a priority in the community that, where, where our office could be of help. Because we see our office as not something that belongs to me. Uh, it belongs to the community and ought to work for the community. So during the pandemic, of course, we've had to shift to more of an online format. So we've done a lot of the the Zoom meetings, the, I know, not as good uh, Zoom meetings, but they're means of connection where we've tried to accomplish much much the same thing. So I've, uh, I've, ha I've had the blessing of, of many great mentors in my life, and I've often heard the refrain that the job of someone in politics is not only to talk, it's to listen. So uh, I would say we begin there, and then with empathy and something I, I love to do, community organizing, helping neighbors connect with neighbors, the uh, sharing of resources, um, and the speaking of truths, we, we, try to, we try to make change, and we've had some success. Mm -hmm. So what have been the main issues in your time as MPP? Uh, well, certainly anything having to do with housing is absolutely critical in our community right now. We are living in a housing affordability crisis. We have a number of neighbors who sleep rough, uh, even through the winter. Uh, we have people sleeping in cars in our city, in bus shelters. Uh, we have many neighbors in a difficult way when it comes to housing. And actually our city had on a percentage basis, if you can believe it, the highest rental increases in the years 2018 and 2019, 13 and a half percent. That's higher than Vancouver, that's higher than Toronto on a per capita basis. So uh, we're, we're seeing and our office is trying to help a number of neighbors who are not housed, who are housing insecure, uh, or who frankly feel trapped in the homes they have that they can never leave, never start a family, never start a business. So uh, that would be, I would say, the overarching one. And then beyond that, we work a lot with people. People who end up in this office uh, are often folks who are in their last moment of appeal. So um, particularly people with disabilities, people living in poverty, uh, elders living on insufficient incomes. Um, when they've exhausted avenues of appeal through uh, the direct source, whether it could be the Ontario Disability Support Program, Ottawa Community Housing, um, various healthcare agencies, educational agencies, they end up here. And so we do the best we can with the resources we have to help them. And uh, it's, I think the, the last conversation I had with our casework manager who does the coordinating of casework and that person had talked to previous persons in that role, we've helped over 7,000 people in three and a half years with, uh, with casework. Mm -hmm. It's a lot of folks mm -hmm. and we've done our best every time. So uh, over these three and a half years then, as you, as we look out over your riding, I mean, we're, we're just in a part of your riding. So, so can, just give me the boundaries again. What, what are the boundaries of the riding? It's huge. So if uh, we're sitting right now, 109 Catherine Street, uh, Catherine and O'Connor. So if you go all the way over to the Rideau Canal, yeah. that's the Eastern boundary. And if you follow it North up to Parliament Hill, that's the Northern boundary, the Ottawa River. Then if you follow that West, all the way past the neighborhood of Westboro, like eight blocks west of Westboro, okay. Maryvale Road, that's the western boundary. It curls around, rather like, uh, if you can imagine the western bit of the state of Texas, where it kind of curls around like that, it curls around um, the Experimental Farm, the neighborhood of Carlton Heights, um, and meets the Rideau River, which is the southern boundary. So our boundaries are literally water on uh, three of the four sides. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then the neighborhoods uh, east of Carleton University, Old Ottawa South, Old Ottawa East, um, you know, about 100,000 people, about 92,000 electors. Could you speak of any issues that 
uh, affect everyone in that riding or do you have to break it down and speak about individual areas in the riding? There, there's a lot of unique neighborhood concerns. So you can talk about affluent neighborhoods, relatively affluent neighborhoods like the Glebe or where I live in Old Ottawa South or Westboro or Wellington West. Mm -hmm. uh, but this neighborhood, this riding represents the diversity of our country in that you, you can go to uh, Chinatown or uh, Central Town West, which is more in the middle of the riding, and that has a, the largest concentration of rooming houses in the city of Ottawa. Uh -huh. So rooming houses are places where often people who are homeless or who are street exposed will share or bunk up on a room for three to five hundred dollars a month. Yeah. Because if you're on ODSP or on Ontario Works, that's what you can stretch your check to to to, uh, to cover. And I've been in a lot of those uh, homes talking to neighbors, and they're in an awful state of repair. So, yeah. so I would say, you know, uh, again, back to housing. Housing is a concern in lower income, marginalized neighborhoods. It's a concern in more affluent neighborhoods where people, uh, you know, if they're looking to move, feel like they can't, um, you know, where, where people are just watching the housing market balloon out of control. Mm -hmm. uh, I think the climate crisis is an issue that affects us all and everybody is thinking about it, talking about it, certainly with what we're seeing on the West Coast with the awful floods um, after the heat waves they've experienced out there. Uh, I think everybody's thinking about opportunity to, to make a decent life and a decent job. We have a real bent towards a gig economy where it's hard to find permanent stable employment. Mm -hmm. um, everybody's certainly thinking about that. Uh, I, I talk a lot uh, to educators and healthcare workers who are stressed out, who feel you know completely beyond uh, themselves. So all of those concerns are shared in the riding, but then every single neighborhood has its own little eccentricity, its own little difference. So you try to appreciate all that. Yeah, so more or less your office is within the uh, part of the riding that, that St. John's is in. That's our, right. our parish boundaries are, right. are a little piece of that. That's right. Uh, from the canal over to Bank Street and yep. from the 417 north to Parliament. Yep. Yep. And so we are experiencing a, a little particular chunk of what Absolutely. your riding is about. Absolutely. And and the, the major changes I, I'm uh, new compared to you. I, I've been here for uh, nine coming on ten months yep. and I know I come in at the tail end of great changes on Elgin Street, a yes. reconstruction and uh, and that since then of course uh, the, the, the lingering effects of the pandemic and, yep. and maybe you've seen uh, some particular aspects of Elgin Street. Uh, Absolutely. Well, I, I well. We certainly heard from a lot of residents and uh, small business owners that were having a tough time during the massive construction and rip up of Elgin Street. Of course, that was all about burying power lines and yeah. making the utilities a lot more amenable to, to small businesses and residents. So I think everybody can breathe a sigh of relief that that seems to be well done and people seem to be happy. But I mean, in your own church, I salute the work of the well. I salute the work that's been done to, to help many of our you know, neighbors in the toughest streets, particularly women. Yeah. Um, so yes, you are, your church is part of the solution. We, we have an expression, Gary, in our community I really love. Many people use called be a solutionary. Uh, ah. it's, it's easy to identify obstacles and problems, and we should, but it's harder sometimes to mobilize that through, through faith or through hope into actual solutions for people. And I would, I would like to say that the well, to all the curators of the well, massive love to all of you. That is an example of Ottawa Centre solutionary uh, work. You, you've done a lot to help people in a difficult spot. Well, this, I think, is an appropriate way to come back from the present time and context sure. to get the scripture to come and meet our present time and context. Mm -hmm. So uh, having had a chance to read that reading and think about it a little bit, yeah. what strikes you about uh, this passage about John the Baptist? Well, I, I mean, for, thanks to you, I've, I've learned that John the Baptist was a rebel and uh, that he was somebody who wanted to call people into passionate uh, pursuit of justice. And what I, when I first read this, what I was thinking about was what guides us, um, what guides us towards what we would think of as success or meaning in our life. And um, as, as you do that, like what are those moments of self-awareness where you're trying to, you know, check yourself a little bit and, you know, be honest and be real. Uh, that notion of repentance that comes across here. The issue is where do we seek meaning? And as we try to check ourselves and be honest with ourselves, as we're trying to find substance in our life, I have encountered personally, and I have seen in many neighbors, a desire to seek affirmation and meaning through stuff, through uh, through mm -hmm. successes to find through stuff or through uh, accolades, through um, title. And I, I'm not going to discount the meaning in that, but what I've learned from Algonquin neighbors, some of uh, you know indigenous neighbors I've had the pleasure to meet, including Claudette Commander, whose grandfather William Commander was 
perhaps one of the most uh, influential and respected of Algonquin peoples in what we call Canada. Um, you know, he used to say that humanity has a choice as we develop as a modern society between embracing what he called materiality, which is that issue of stuff and acquisition of things and title, uh, or spirituality, embracing one's, one's inner voice, one's inner sense of meaning, and the notion of spirit in the wider world, whether that's defined through uh, an organized religion or through one's connection with nature. Uh, there's a lot about our society that pushes us away from that, 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 that yeah. speeds us up, uh, hurries us up towards what we deem as material success. And uh, Claudette's grandfather and Claudette herself has always been reminding me, don't forget to listen to your inner spirit. Don't forget as you seek that meaning, that repentance to, to tune into that because uh, it's gonna teach you a lot. And I, I, that, is a, that is a lesson that's a teaching I take deeply in my heart that I see, if I'm, if I'm right, I see reflected here. You see in uh, John the Baptist. I certainly do. Announcing a different way and announcing uh, who, that Jesus will follow him in that way. Absolutely. And, a way for us to follow him. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, Joel, thanks for this, and I'll look forward to inviting you to come and be with us in person at St. John's uh, sometime. I can't wait to see you. I can't wait to see you, and hello to everybody. All the best to you and your families. Thanks so much. Take care, Gary. This week, NPR published a thoughtful piece, The Mystery of Where Omicron Comes From and Why It Matters. Scientists take regular samples of the coronavirus to study how it evolves and to be prepared for new variants. The Omicron virus was quickly blamed on Africa, and the South African government just as quickly called this out as prejudice. Blame this on media oversimplification, but it's about being ready. Where did this mutation come from, seemingly out of the blue? The first hypothesis is that it came from an animal source, that the virus moved from humans into an animal population, then it mutated, and then it migrated back into humans. That's actually possible and an article on the CBC shows how coronavirus has entered the North American white-tailed deer population. But the scientists dismiss this hypothesis because we would see some animal DNA inserted into the changed virus, and we are not seeing that. The second hypothesis is that there has been cryptic spread. That means mutations in a part of the world that is not being monitored by regular testing. A mutation that is more contagious could have developed over time in an area with little testing. This is where the finger was pointed at Southern Africa. 
But scientists also dismiss this scenario. We would have already noticed many cases of the virus in those countries that do not have robust surveillance systems, and we haven't. So there's a third hypothesis. The coronavirus has incubated in a person who was already immunocompromised. Someone whose immune system was already suppressed, but who was still strong enough for coronavirus not to kill them. The virus would linger inside such a person month after month, and there would be continuous mutations, so the virus could adapt to better evade that person's immune cells. So, who is already immunocompromised? Someone with HIV. There are people who are not on antiretroviral drugs for HIV. In fact, they have found such a person, a woman whose HIV care was mismanaged, and she would not be the only one. It's a hypothesis, but it's the hypothesis that currently makes the most sense to researchers. And so we see that everything intersects. In the same way as a physiotherapist or chiropractor might point out that limping from a knee injury is going to show up with problems in your hip, everything is related, everything intersects. Leave HIV untreated or inadequately treated and a pathway becomes easier for coronavirus mutations. The theme of Indigenous AIDS Awareness Week is very appropriately Indigenous response to intersecting pandemics. This intersection matters for the future of World AIDS Day 2022 and it matters for the future of COVID-19. John the Baptist was aware of how everything intersects. That's why he moved to the edge to be a rebel, to call people to repentance, and to try to draw the big picture for people. I like the word used by our MPP, Joel Hardin. If we are going to be solutionaries, people with solutions, we have a challenge. How do we solve separate problems when everything intersects? There are so many angles and we can't be about all of them, not as individuals and also not as a parish church. We are going to pick a few aspects to work on together and we are gonna trust that other individuals, other communities and other community organizations are also doing their part. We are going to have to be complementary to the good work that is already going on. I recommend John the Baptist for how he gets us to see the systemic and to choose our individual and smaller group repentances and turnings as collectively adding up to systemic change. Before anyone is tempted to say that you are inspired by John the Baptist, to always stand on the sidelines and cast stones, that is a misreading of John. He called people to reform their lives in specific ways, and this is good, but he did not call on everyone to become their own version of John the Baptist as eternal critics of everyone else's response. Let's look to John, not as calling us to be like him, but rather as calling us to examine what we can each do constructively as our part and what we can do collectively as St. John's. And let us now conclude by praying with John the Baptist in mind as he comes to us in these Advent scriptures. Almighty God, who sent your servant John the Baptist to prepare your people to welcome the Messiah, Inspire us, the ministers and stewards of your truth, to turn our disobedient hearts to you, that when the Christ shall come again to be our judge, we may stand with confidence before his glory, who is alive and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen.